John Cipher, welcome to Counterintelligence. <laughs> My pleasure. Nice to be here. John, um, I know your background very well. You're a 30-year veteran of the clandestine service. And uh, actually, could you just summarize your uh, career for us real quick? Uh, sure. I, I was in CIA for almost 30 years. And as you know, the CIA is sort of broken up into sort of big tribes, if you will, a big analytical group, a science and technology group. And then what has been called the clandestine service, the director, director of operations, which is the espionage side of the organization. So spend most of your time overseas. Your job is to spot assess and recruit people to provide intelligence for the United States. We call them sources or assets. Mm. You might call them spies, people to spy for the United States. And our job is to be the sort of collector of last resort. The, we collect information that the U.S. government can't get any other way, whether it be through diplomats or academics or NSA or satellites or what have you. Right, of course. I always like to start off with, uh, I guess, what to me is the most important question. Uh, <laughs> let's say we're on a sliding scale of one to ten. How our uh, current president? I mean, how how much is he uh, looking for the right word here? Uh, how bad is the situation with Russia? <laughs> that's that's what I'm trying to say. Um, the situation with Russia is really bad. It's all, but the thing is, it's always been very bad. They've seen us as the main enemy for you know much of their time since World War II, um, and we as a as a country have gone back and forth on you know trying to appease them or or hope that they would come into our fold or mm. or or during the Cold War, obviously looking at them as as our main uh, adversary and enemy too. Um, it's particularly dangerous now because we have a commander in chief who doesn't actually believe the intelligence that he's being told. And frankly, it's not even intelligence. It's, it's written in the Mueller report. It's, it's written in a series of indictments. Every single ally, uh, ally of ours is telling us exactly the same things that the Russians are up to. So it's, it's pretty troubling. But I think most people who work under Trump are pretty well aware of the threat. Yeah, uh, exactly. And in, in terms of, uh, whatever relationships, business, or otherwise corruption. Uh, what do you think of, of his personal, uh, again, uh, it's so hard to pick the word, the right word here, but uh, <laughs> vulnerability? Uh, right. Well, you know, from our side, my job overseas is to look for people who have accessed information that we can't get any other way, mm -hmm. and then assess them, look at them. What is it about them that might make them be willing to spy? Now, most people aren't, but we're looking for exactly that. We're looking for vulnerabilities that we can manipulate to our benefit. So I'm going to try to meet somebody. I'm going to see you know, what they do, what makes them tick, what do they think about their boss, what do they think about their country, you know, what help do they need, you know, is their family in trouble? All, I'm looking for ways to slowly build a relationship of trust and at the same time move them slowly in a, in a conspiratorial relationship towards working with me. And along that process, I may determine that they're not the right fit. They may not want to. But what Mr. Trump is providing is he's providing a sort of a, a potpourri of vulnerabilities, of things that can be manipulated, of, of, of ways that he could be taken advantage of. You know, for example, as simple as running for president <laughs> while he is doing business in Russia and then lying to the American people about something that the Russians are very clearly aware of. To them, that's incredible leverage. They know that he's lying, and and he knows that they know they're lying. That's something that could that an intelligence officer would want to take advantage of. Yeah, it seems like in any other administration or any um, in any case, that would be the thing that puts that would you know lead to an impeachment or whatever. But it seems like in this case, I guess we never factored on that maybe one party just isn't going to do anything. And it just seems like the normal accountability doesn't seem to be happening. Uh, well, what's happened, unfortunately, is our own politics have become so hyper-partisan that there's a large portion of the population, to include Mr. Trump, who sees the other party as the bigger enemy than our real enemies. So if you believe that Hillary Clinton is the enemy and anything that it takes to, to damage her is okay, to include working with Russians or Chinese or criminals or what have you, then, you know, we're really skewed and we're in a tough place because traditionally, yes, Democrats and Republicans have, have battled each other in the partisan arena and the political arena. But we understood as a country, you know, what were the threats and what were our real our real enemies and, who, and the notion of siding with a foreign intelligence service over somebody, another American who just happens to be in a different party is is pretty troubling. And I hopefully will come around and realize the the, the folly of our ways. 
Yeah. I was also curious. Uh, I don't, I don't know if this is a question you can answer or not, but in your time in uh, the CIA, especially when you were leading the, uh, the, the Russia division, did you ever come across Trump's name in any capacity? No, no. I mean, for the most part, you know, I get at the end of the day, the CIA is about collecting foreign intelligence, mm. whereas the FBI is job. They do counterintelligence, which is trying to stop Russian intelligence from gaining a foothold in the United States. And so we don't, as a, as a, as a rule, look at Americans or try to see what Americans are up to. Sure. If Donald Trump was involved in, in shady business deals or dirty money, that's not the thing that would really come across our our, you know, you know, what we're looking at. If we had a source inside the KGB, for example, who was telling us the Americans they were looking at, and Donald Trump was one of them, yes, that might come across our screen. I'm not aware, I'm not aware of that, but in the but at the same time, one of the things that we practice inside CIA is is need to know. So sure. if I'm if I'm working on Russia things, I may know something, but then then two years later when I'm living in Manila or Japan or whatever, I'm not privy to that kind of information. So I'm not saying that there is some information about President Trump that we came across through foreign sources, but I'm not aware of it. Of course. Uh, were there any names in the Mueller report that rung a bell from your career? Anybody you came across? Uh, uh, not so much from my career, other than the Russian tradecraft is, you know, a hundred percent consistent with, you know, what we've seen decade after decade and from the inside and when we've had sources inside the Kremlin. So there's no surprises in what they've done and what they've tried to do and what we've seen, you know, the individuals. Yeah. I don't, you know, I never heard of Paul Manafort until all this stuff <laughs> came up, but he certainly fits exactly the kind of uh, sleazy person that the Russians are looking to do business with. Carter Page, never heard of him either. That would be, but clearly the FBI had heard of him because yeah. they were tracking Russian intelligence officers in New York and came across their relationship with Carter Page. And so, you know, this is as much a counterintelligence issue as an intelligence issue. Some of the notes uh, or some of the, uh, I guess it would be the, from the Russian side, their notes about Carter Page were hilarious. I mean, just like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm sure you'll relate as a fellow, you know, as although they were on the other side, uh, I guess they were saying the guy, this guy's, I'm just paraphrasing it, like he's too dumb, <laughs> but but maybe we'll just keep him in a back pocket. Um, well, I was just, before you came on, was reading an article, just came out in Political by Zach Dorfman, about uh, Adam Schiff, who was obviously a head of the Intel Committee and in the House of Representatives, who used to be a prosecutor in Los Angeles and sort of made his chops as an early prosecutor, prosecuting an FBI special agent who was spying for the Russians, guys by the name of Miller. And... When you read that article, you read exactly what the Russians are looking for. And funny, as I read that, I was also rereading a book about Clayton Lone Tree, who was a uh, Marine Corps security guard in the embassy of Moscow who ended up spying for the Russians. And in both cases, Lone Tree and this guy Miller, they were just, you know, uh, they were they were sort of idiots and fools <laughs> and, and, you know, didn't fit in, were sort of malcontents within, inside, inside even their own organizations. And the Russians were able to, to sniff it out and make contact with them and manipulate them into becoming spies. And from what I've seen publicly about Carter Page, he's exactly the kind of person that the Russians would love to glom onto because his naivete and his, you know, seemingly desire for anybody to become his friend is somebody that the Russians would look to take advantage of. Yeah, I mean, it's like I, you know, I basically work in the entertainment industry and it's, I mean, it's it's just the last couple of years have been like a uh, like a bad Charlie Sheen spy movie. I mean, it, <laughs> I, or maybe is the world of of spycraft actually more funny than any of us knew? Is yeah, it's definitely more funny than <laughs> anyone know. And and part of the thing is, you know, um, you are looking when you're looking for someone to to report to you or spy for you, if you will. Yeah, you're looking for someone with a certain set of vulnerabilities, but you're also looking for someone who's not so dopey that they're going to get themselves caught or get in trouble. So the best spies, at least on our side, are ones that have, you know, a strong desire. Either they want to move to the States or they hate their system or they hate their boss or something that we can use. Um, going after sort of weak and sort of dim-witted people may get you in the door and may get you a little bit, but that's not really why you want, where you want to build sort of long-term success, at least on the U.S. side. The Russians, you know, they're, they're glad to do this because if it falls apart, 
it, it still does damage to the United States because, you know, we start tearing into each other. You know, the, you know, if the FBI arrests one of their own, it makes them look bad. If the Marine, someone in the Marines is arrested, it makes them look bad. So it benefits the Russians to go for people like that. Yeah, I think I read it in one of your articles that the the uh, as you said, you know, it's funny. It's interesting that you said that it sounds like the Russians part of their aim is chaos. And that sounds like somebody else I know. Uh, the the White House. Uh, there's some kind of parallel there. Uh, a chaos agent, or yeah, they do it for different reasons. Obviously, I think, um, and that's one of the things we need to really understand and focus on is, you know, we learned from 2016 from the intelligence reports and everything that the Russians supported Donald Trump, and I think Donald Trump believes they supported him because, you know, they like him and think he's special and can do a good job. But frankly, the Russians have been very consistent over time. They see us as the enemy. They're trying to do damage to the United States. Chaos here is meant to make us weaker. So they they like Donald Trump, sure, but they like Donald Trump because he was the chaos candidate. Right. They know that he makes us turn on each other and, and it makes us weaker. And that's one of the reasons they support him. And they, you know, they don't care really about Donald Trump. When Donald Trump eventually becomes of no use to them, they'll find ways to use leverage and use that information that they have on him to continue this making us weak and it'll turn on him whenever it suits them. Do you think they ever might, uh, I don't know, hypothetically just drop all that information on the internet or some video or yeah. something? See, that's the thing by giving him, by giving the Russians this leverage by lying and letting the Russians have information that the American public doesn't have that gives them, you know, that makes Trump sort of complicit in a, in a, a problem with them. And yeah. so it a lot, it gives them, a weapon they can use at any time they choose. So sure, this is something, you know, the Russians are in the catbird seat. They have more information about things than we do, and therefore they can dribble them out or drop them or cause pain sort of whenever they choose. Do you think this was the greatest intelligence operation in history, or is there anything else that is comparable? Uh, wow, you know, there's an, I don't know if it was the greatest intelligence in history, because there's been, you know, tricking the, the Nazis as we were going into Normandy. You know, there's an interesting one that sort of is a parallel, and I only read a little bit about it. Um, the British, in the lead up to World War II, had a large office at, out of the Rockefeller Plaza in New York City, mm. and they were essentially doing disinformation and trying to get us to join them in the war. And they were doing all kinds of stuff. They were buying time on TV and radio shows. They were trying to buy congressmen to support them. They were trying to get the United States to join the allies in the war. And it was actually quite effective. Now, of course, we don't remember it because they had, became our allies. And they, you know, at the end of the day, they were doing, they were trying to do what ended up being the right thing. But they were using a, an intelligence service to try to, you know, undermine, is not the right word, but, but to influence the United States. And they were quite successful in that. I have sort of a big picture question for you. I what I I think I've asked many people have come on this show or the prior version of this show before we joined up with Forensic News. And we we have this, I guess, the greatest military and I'm sure intelligence uh, agencies in, in the world. Yet, how did this happen? How did <laughs> a, how did a, this this individual? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I can't say anywhere. How did this happen? <laughs> um. First of all, the, the one thing is, yes, I do think we have the most powerful military in the history of the world. We also have incredibly successful intelligence community. And remember, you know, the, the human intel side of it, the part that I represent, is a small piece of what we're trying to do. It's just that, like I said, the collector of last resort. Hmm. Um, but for the Russians, the intelligence services are much more central to the, you know, what they're doing. We have a president who is in the KGB, Vladimir Putin, and he sort of grew up with the sword and shield being the most important um, institution in, this, in, in the last years of the Soviet Union and certainly in, in modern day Russia. So, so using the tools of subversion and agitation and disinformation and fake news and espionage and all these things they do is much more central to them. So, and, and they're laser focused on us. Whereas we, so what were the things that made 2016 successful? Now, I did posit they've been doing this forever, these kind of active measures. Why was 2016 so successful when in the past it wasn't successful? Because they've done a lot of these things in the past. I think there's a number of things that make it different. I think one is the ability to weaponize social media is something that's new. Mm -hmm. um, 
they used to have to go recruit a source in a in a newspaper somewhere in India to put out a false story and then take that news report and try to move it through the media food chain to eventually make its way to the West. For example, you know, the, the story that the Pentagon created the AIDS virus, that it was a U.S. invention wow. to keep the third world down, was a Russian disinformation effort, which was successful, but it took years and it sort of pushed its way through. Now you can pump that right into Facebook. You can you, you can push get trolls to put it, push it through Twitter. You can weaponize that really quickly. So there's one piece. Another piece is we were so laser focused on terrorism for so since 9-11. We, in some ways, both you know the Clinton administration and the Bush administration and the Obama administration all sort of believed that the Russians would come around, that they must see radical Islamic terrorism as the main threat. And therefore, if we just sort of worked with them, they would figure that out. Well, they didn't figure it out. They see us as the main threat. Um, so we weren't really paying attention like we used to pay attention in the Cold War to the, what the Russians and things were up to. Thirdly, I think Vladimir Putin, is his, his personality is a key thing here. He hated Hillary Clinton. Mm. He actually blamed Hillary Clinton and the State Department for trying to, in 2012, meddle in his election to become president, where there was actually people on the streets protesting against him when he thought he had complete control. Um, he took that personally. The Panama Papers, if you remember, were a thing that came out mm. and embarrassed him. It showed it showed where his millions of dollars are, and it showed like how he was using personal friends to store his billions. Uh, he took that as a personal attack by the United States. I think he thinks the CIA did that. I have no knowledge, or I don't know if they did or not, but he took it personally. So, so later Putin was probably willing to take greater risks than he was in the past. And you know, at the end of the day, the biggest thing that made this more successful is our hyper-partisanship. We were so ready to hate each other that it only took a little match to throw into the thing and turn us against each other. And so the Russians, you know, again, they're laser focused on us. They have a good understanding of our system and they know where to push buttons. So they know they were they were trying to pu push into communities that don't usually vote to stay home. And, you know, Black Lives Matter and all this other kind of stuff they were pushing. At the same time, they were pushing outrage into some of these right-wing groups that don't usually vote to go out and vote for, you know, the chaos candidate. So, so yes, it was incredibly successful, but a lot of things came together to make it different this time. And so, if I understand you correctly, basically, the we were so focused on counterterrorism that this just... I, someone I know who I trust said that uh, the government, is it's kind of like a slow-moving ship, and to <laughs> redirect it is... it's. It's no, it's no uh, criticism. It's just it's very difficult once we're on that course. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, yeah, that's that's very right. And you know, you look at the FBI, and I, you know, it, it's so hard. we asked the, the F, excuse me, the FBI to do so much. They're supposed to do counterintelligence. They're supposed to pay attention to what the Chinese are trying to do here and the Russians. They're trying to go after fraud and tax fraud and bank fraud. They're looking at. They're trying to stop every terrorist if if, if someone comes in with a crazy. Um, threat that they're going to blow up the Brooklyn Bridge, the FBI has to run that run that down. And so um, lots of FBI officers are taken off the counterintelligence target to go after terrorism. Certainly saw it in the CIA. You know, the day after 9-11, people who were working on Russia, the next day had placards up saying, you're now on the, the counterterrorism task force. You know, wow. the United States, you know, reacts to, you know, big issues and sometimes sort of fools itself into thinking, you know, everything that we're focused on, the rest of the world is. Um, and so, you know, I think over time we became pretty effective at, at counterterrorism, but, you know, the Russians weren't looking at things the same way we were. It's, yeah, I mean, it's like, it's not funny, but there, it's just so comical that they're, it's a weapon that, I think I, they spent $100,000 on Facebook ads, according to the Mueller report. I mean, some... A uh, hundred thousand dollar investment, and some guy who's willing to forge credit cards in Northern California, and and here we are. I know. <laughs> well, look at think about it this way then too is, you know, now we're starting to look and see what, what the Russians were up to, and we, you know, we haven't probably put in the resources to to stop it. But I worry now that we'll so focus on the Russians that we won't realize that you know China is a far bigger threat. Mm. You know, Russia is. A, country with an economy the size of Portugal, you know, has right. less less money than the city of New York. Um, they are very good at creating, causing havoc and, and doing pain, but they're, but it, these are asymmetric tools. They're, they're, this is the warfare of a weaker state against a stronger state. 
China, on the other hand, literally has a you know 50 year vision of overtaking the United States, becoming the most the biggest economic power in the world, and then ha and also continuing to have intelligence and military support to that as well. And so, you know, I worry that you know the United States has a lot of responsibilities. We're focused on what's happening in North Korea, what's happening in Iran, what's happening with China, with Russia. All we have to handle all of these things, and we have to keep all those balls in the air. We can't get overly focused on one. And and right now we're more focused internally because the president is sort of doesn't understand the damage he's doing to our institutions and our allies. And it's going to be quite dangerous to take on this vast amount of challenges if we if our allies are not with us. I'm sure there's all kinds of plans in, uh, let's say, in the CIA for, I know everyone's watching everyone and at any moment you can be hauled back there to be polygraphed or for any reason <laughs> there's a suspicion. Was there, any, was there ever any plan for what would happen if a presidential candidate was co-opted <laughs> or his team? Uh, they, no plan. They, no plan. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. See, I mean, that, that, that's what's unusual about you know the Trump people is they're doing things. A lot of times they'll say, well, whatever they did was, wasn't was illegal. Well, because we didn't think we had to make laws about some of this stuff. You figured that you know someone running for the president of the United States would actually believe their oath or be patriotic. <laughs> they wouldn't try to do damage to their own institutions, or they might listen to the people in their own government. And so there's a lot of things that are happening that, that you know we're, we're not prepared for because we would never expect... A president of the United States to behave this way. I was reading uh, Greg Miller's uh, The Apprentice uh, yeah. and uh, the opening where I guess Trump was speaking at the CIA that, that first day. And there's just a chilling part where I guess they call it, I guess this was where you worked, Russia House. Is that the mm -hmm. informal name? Yeah. And where they're, they're saying there's no way we're bringing him or anyone or even close to here. I mean, that's a bone chilling <laughs> statement. Is that, was that what actually was happening? Uh, yeah, I read the book. It's a good book. I can't remember the specifically, but but they are you know people in CIA don't work for you know one party or another. You know, I spent twenty eight years with with buddies like all around the world in hardship places, day in and day out. You know, on all kinds of things. No idea what their political views are. Nor have I ever been in a meeting ever in my twenty eight years in CIA. We talked where we talked about. Democrats or Republicans are supporting mm -hmm. this candidate or that candidate or or anything. Whereas President Trump tends to think that somehow the CIA and others were conspiring against a potential presidential campaign or what have you. You know, no, our focus is overseas on threats to the United States. Um, Russia House handles very, very sensitive information. You know, um, now you see that the attorney general supposedly is trying to go back and look at, you know, what sources CIA might have had to make the assessments that they did that the Russians were working against us in 2016. Um, you know, we take, we protect those sources and secrets, you know, incredibly well. Like usually even the director of CIA doesn't know the names of our sources. So wow. it's, it's chilling the, no the notion that um, somebody like the president or the attorney general want to, want to look deep into our institutions and find scapegoats or people that they can sort of blame for their own political troubles. You know, we saw them do it at the FBI. They, there's names of mid-level people like Peter Strzok and Lisa Page and Bruce Orr and um, these others that have become sort of political whipping boys for the right. And that's really hurtful and, and, and dangerous. And I, I worry about them trying to do the same because it what it does is it, it can people outside don't understand how these institutions work. So when the president of the United States says these things, it confuses them and scares them and makes them think that their institutions are working against them. And that's just simply not true. Right. They're going to, it seems like the playbook is they're going to, it's, this is, uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're going looking to. looking for boogeymen it, to attack, yeah. right? They're looking to blame somebody and say, hey, this horrible person was working against us. And, you know, and there's people out there that, that you know, want to believe that. And it's just, it's nuts. Is there any plan, or I don't know if you would even call it civil disobedience? I mean, if the threat is coming from inside the House, <laughs> can they? Can the CIA or the FBI? I, I mean, can we stop this? Can we not hand over the intelligence? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, again, it's not set up to work that way because you expect you know the, the people above you to be on the same page. Um, there's not a plan to sort of. Um, not to work against that or anything. Um, 
it's I mean, I think there's lots of public servants that are looking to do their job. And I think the Mueller report's a good a good source for this. If you mm -hmm. read the Mueller report closely, President Trump was asking people to do all kinds of nutty and illegal <laughs> things. And essentially he was saved because people in the institutions just didn't do it. And the people who worked for him said no to him or just thought what he was suggesting was so off that they, they didn't do it. Um, and so I do think our, our institutions, the people in will, will continue to follow the law. And if the president is trying to sort of do things that, that uh, push against the law, they will, they will push back. Right. But at the end of the day, you can't expect that to be our savior. We can't have, you know, mid-level, low-level people trying to resist the president of the United States as the thing that is going to save us. We need Congress to step up and realize as a co-equal branch of government that it needs to you know, really look at this president and push back against where he where he's uh, misbehaving, if you will. Yeah. And they seem to have uh, there's that's a whole other thing. I, I don't know what the, the problem is there, but oh, I have an idea. But uh, <laughs> did, you, did you have a, f a favorite post uh, in your time in the CIA? Is there anything you could a favorite post? Well, you I, could tell I, you? Were, I worked I, lo I really loved everywhere I was <laughs> and really benefited from it. I Russia was fascinating to me, but it wasn't. It wasn't uh, nice, and it wasn't comfortable. It wasn't fun. I used to tell people it was almost like a, like a heroin addiction. It's like you were addicted to it because it was so fascinating. Huh. Like you were followed everywhere. Your house was bugged. Wow. Uh, everything you did was sort of under a microscope. And the work, you know, when you succeeded was so fulfilling, but the the danger that you could take could risk the lives of one of your assets at any moment by making a little mistake was something the pressure was quite good. So I really en enjoyed it professionally and, and benefited a lot from it. But there's other places I worked. I worked in the Balkans during the Balkan Wars. Wow. I worked in Southeast Asia, uh, going against sort of the Al-Qaeda presence out in Southeast Asia. Um, uh, I was in, you know, in, in Pakistan and the wars on terrorism stuff. And so, and I was in Europe, all of them I loved, I have to say. It's a great, it's a great uh, job. Did you find any similarities with the various, uh, I assume you worked under various dictators. Did, was there any similarities you noticed uh, with those people? Yeah, uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, in some ways, it, it's interesting to see, for example, like during the Yugoslav wars, Milosevic, how he was able, he was the, Yugoslav and then Serbian sort of dictator about how you could spin, how you could control the press and spin up nationalism um, in a way where, and you see this some in the United States and sort of the, the bad part of our politics is a way of making yourself the victim. So the Serbs in what was then the former Yugoslavia were a plur plurality. They were the largest ethnic group. And so, you know, other ethnic groups were worried that Serbia, because they were the most powerful, could be the most dangerous if, if things turned. But what he did is he told the Serbs that they were the victims. Oh, my God, you're victims. They're, they're looking against you. And the problem is when you st stir up the most powerful group and make them feel like they're victims so that, therefore, they can do whatever they want, it ends up causing chaos and scaring the hell out of the rest of the... Uh, Sounds so familiar. See, uh, well, it's the thing here. If you tell white Christians that they're, you know, that they are under assault and, you know, Christianity is going to go under and, you know, the white people are going to lose out when in fact they're the majority and they're the most powerful group. You force, you force some on the, the fringes of those people to really believe they're victims and think that they are righteous in being able to attack others. And, you know, when they're, when a, when a majority is attacking a minority, it's a really scary thing. I've seen that in my time overseas and let's hope it doesn't really go any further here. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a, pretty calm guy. I definitely not prone to overstatements, but this thing just the last week with the intelligence and bar and, uh, I just, I, I don't get what the holdup is with Congress. And I don't know if that's part because they're, I mean, I, I actually, I do think I know what it is. I think, I think they're afraid. I think it's just pure fear. And like Roosevelt said, I mean, you know, you gotta, you gotta get over that fear. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, the, the people, you know, people are so interested in keeping their jobs. Mm. I mean, there's a lot of Republican senators and others that understand how out of bounds President Trump is, but they don't want to say anything publicly because they fear they're going to they're going to lose their job or they're, they're, someone further to the right is going to beat them out in a, in a primary or they're going to, 
and you know, at the end of the day, your job is less important than sort of doing the right thing. Their job is to represent the people, and their job is also to educate the people. And so, so even if the people under them and the people who vote for them don't understand things, it's their job to try to do their best and both educate them. And if they can't do so, losing the election is not the worst thing that can happen to somebody. Could you tell us about the day to day life of a uh, when you were you know in the field? What was, what was that like? Uh, um, for the most part, I worked in embassies overseas. There's a variety of different ways of, of sort of doing the espionage mission. Um, and so, you know, I had for much of much of my time, I had my family with me. So you get the kids oh. and stuff off to school and, and you know, <laughs> wife off the job. Um, and then your job is to sort of go into the embassy and, and ma- manage a group of people whose job is to collect intelligence. And so there's a variety of ways to do that. Um, you know, you have to keep up on you want to pr- first learn the language of the place you're at. You want to understand their culture so that you can be effective there. You want to understand the political and historical issues there. So it's a lot of reading. It's a lot of writing. It's a lot of making relationships and contacts, both with you know allies who are doing the same kind of thing that can sort of help you. Um, as you move up in the senior levels, you're also working with the local p- police and security service. You know, if we're trying to stop terrorism in you know, Vietnam, for example, mm-hmm. you might want to work with the Vietnamese pe- services who understand their their societies to, to find ways to leverage and help them uh, uncover things and give us information that can help us be more effective and use our global reach to uh, to succeed. So it's a wonderful job. You know, every two, three years, you're coming back and learning a new culture, a new history. It's like it's like getting a master's degree every two or three mm-hmm. years to go somewhere else and then sort of immerse yourself in another country. You go to Japan, you might go to India, you might go to Pakistan, wow. what have you. And it, it's, it's, it, it's really quite fun, I think. How is the intelligence community dealing with the, what's going on now in this country? I mean, how are they, do they just go to work every day? Do they, is it like, what's, what's yeah. the inner workings? Um, for the, as time goes by, it probably gets more troubling for people. And I don't want to speak for them because one of the things you do is when you leave the government, you know, you were working on classified and sensitive materials. And so you don't want to look like you're reaching in and trying to, you know, look into things, like I said, need to know. Like I, once you're out, you don't need to know the specifics <laughs> of what's happening in any, each sort of case. But one thing I can tell you, for example, in CIA, usually the only person that's a political appointee is the director. Mm-hmm. Everybody else moves up through the, the ranks. Whereas in Commerce Department, a good, you know, two thirds of, of the people who work, senior people, managers are from the outside. A new administration comes in and they put people in senior positions and CIA is unlike that. Um, so everybody who works there is focused on the mission. And our mission is to work overseas, collect intelligence. Um, and so it's very easy to just put your head down and focus on what you're doing. You know, if things seem messed up in Washington, you know, then, okay, go to India for two years and focus on Indian issues and mm. collect things. And if things are messed up again, then then go off to Russia and focus on Russian things. Um, and, and when I say when things are messed up, it was like if, you know, if, if, if I'm almost thinking inside the building or whatever. But now it's sort of the same thing. There's probably a lot of people, at least in the early years of the Trump time, saying, yeah, I don't understand this. He seems to not respect us. But, but, you know, I can focus, all I can do is focus on my work. I'm going to go, um, I'm going to go overseas. I'm going to focus on my job and, you know, hope for the best. But as time goes, as time goes on, you've got to worry about that, you know, he still doesn't get it. The fact that, you know, the president of the United States is not listening to reason or is not supporting uh, his law enforcement, Justice Department or intelligence sources, you probably get quite troubled by that, especially the more senior you are in the, in the agencies. We know that. And I just, by the way, I want to thank again. I know you're being very generous with your time. So I just want to thank you. Uh, I think like Scott and I were talking about this, how we don't like to be critical of media because that's jumping on a dangerous bandwagon, but there's, there's such a disappointment at times with our big institutions. That's why we started doing this. We want, I don't know, we want other voices to be heard like ours. So I, again, I just want to thank you for, uh, you know, taking time out to you know, we're not MSNBC. Uh, no, no problem. Well, I'm, just am- I'm amazed that my dogs and kids have they've been walking by. They've been really quiet. So well, I'm, I'm glad they haven't, they haven't caused you any problem. But yeah, I mean, this is one of the things that we sort of want to get across to. Yes, our institutions should be held accountable. People 
in these large institutions of lots of people, the mistakes will be made. Um, people should be held accountable. People who break the law should should go to jail. All of those things. But for the vast majority of people in those places, they're public servants. They're trying to do the best they can. They care about the country. They're following the law. And, and they're working on behalf of the U.S. people. John, we know that uh, from the New York Times that uh, a large, uh, uh, it's just hard to even say this stuff, a large amount of people in the White House were given security clearances who shouldn't have them. What, why do they want those clearances? And what are, what's the worst case scenario for what's happening with that information? Yeah, that's a real, that's a real problem. And I think that's, that's the kind of thing that resonates through the national security structure. So like I said, people at CIA might not want to follow the politics too closely because they're working on their own issues. But they understand that every year they have to put in, they have to tell the U.S. government everything, you know, who they're dating, who, what, you know, where their money is, where they, what loans they have. Um, you know, you have to go through, you have to go through a polygraph, you have to go through background checks. You know, if you make any of the mistakes that these people have made in the White House, you would lose your job and lose your clearance. And so it just it's just elemental fairness. They're probably saying, this is crazy that I have to do this for my mid-level job, you know, with, no, with very little pay. Those people in the White House are the most important jobs in the country. Often many of them making tons of money on the outside don't have to follow the same rules. And that probably causes a lot of pain. Now, the reason they want and need those clearances is because a great majority of the big issues of the day, you need to have highest level clearance. So someone like um, the president's son-in-law, he, if he's claiming to work on, on Israel and Israeli-Palestinian peace, the information that you receive from the Israelis, for example, at the highest level is of the highest security nature. You cannot be effective with a low level, just secret clearance because you'll show up to, to manage meetings of people all who, all of whom have more information than you do because you don't have clearance. So I understand why they want the clearance, mm -hmm. but by breaking those rules, it, it's really making it hard for others in the system to realize, hey, why am I being held to a certain account? Why would I lose my job in certain circumstances when people above me don't? And that's the kind of thing where we live in foreign countries. When you live in Russia and you realize the Russians look at their people in the Kremlin and realize they're all billionaires and you realize the corruption, it makes you, you know, dislike your country and maybe be willing to help and work for the, the United States. And so I worry that people in our system see the, the unfairness and the corruption and they're going to lash out in ways that are unhealthy. Jared Kushner asked for a, uh, he asked, I think one of the Russians, it's in the Mueller report, uh, if they could use a secret room inside the <laughs> Russian embassy. I mean, like, Really? Uh, well, it's so nuts that the Russians said no. Yes. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the I'm sure I had a point there. Maybe I'm just still just shaking my no, head. No, no. Well, you should yeah. shake your head. It, yeah. It's just, I mean, now some of this, and like if you're, again, if you read the Mueller report closely, and I'm sure you did, too, I think they got away with some because they were just so stupid. Like, so I think they looked at um, President Trump's son with the meeting in Trump Tower in June 2016, and almost, even though they understood the, the, you know, the unpatriotic, unethical, immoral, and just ridiculous nature of him agreeing to that meeting without telling the proper people or the FBI, they essentially gave him a pass because he was so naive and immature and dumb that, that you know, they couldn't prove, you know, corrupt or criminal intent. Um, and so a lot of these people sort of got off because they just were so ignorant of the system uh, and were just so used to sort of running sort of in sleazy areas that you couldn't prove prove them as criminals. But but others, on the other hand, like like Manafort, definitely understood what the Russians were up to and had had long experience in places like that. So understood what the Russians would be trying trying to do. And what's interesting about him is he lied from the beginning, was able willing to take a prison sentence on other things. And so, you know, someone who might have been critical and had real knowledge of collusion or conspiracy, if you will, uh, he's the one that lied from the, all the way through. I believe you said in one of your articles that if one, if you were to pick one person who's an actual agent, like of Russia, it would be Manafort. Did I, did I get that right? Well, I think that's right. I mean, I want to be careful to suggest like, I know I have no of course. sense. Um, 
but he made millions in the in that dirty pond of Ukraine, Russia, and out there. He dealt. He understood. If you live in Russia and you make money in Russia, you understand that there's a that there's an overlap. There's mafia. There's regular business. There's the the state and the Kremlin. There's the intelligence services, and there's crime and mafia groups, and they all interact. So Americans, if you're a businessman, you assume if you're involved in business relationships, you don't worry that the state might be involved or intelligence agencies might be involved or crime might be involved. But the Russians can use, even regular businessmen, they can, they can twist them and use them to their, their advantage. So, so money coming out of Russia can be dirty money that can be used to sort of corrupt people and make them complicit. For example, look at this guy that, that's talked about in the Mueller report, um, Yevgeny Prigozhin. He is the guy. He was a. He made millions and essentially billions off of you know restaurants and 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 becoming an oligarch close to Trump. You know, so so quote unquote unquote he's a businessman, but the Kremlin then goes to him and says, "Hey, we need help in Syria," and therefore, he this businessman who runs restaurants is now running paramilitary groups in Syria. They say, hey, we need help uh, influencing the U.S. election. So this guy, Yegeni Prigozhin, who's a restaurateur, runs, owns and the troll factories that were running the all of the efforts through Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and everything against us. And so, you know, you got a person who's just a businessman, but he's working on behalf of the state, on behalf of the intelligence service, on behalf of paramilitary groups. These things all interact. And so someone like Manafort, he knows that, you know, if you're dealing with a Russian businessman, you also have to be aware that that person may have ties to the Kremlin and to the intelligence services and criminal groups. One thing that I think is a little uh, frustrating for the public is that we see these things happening. And except for I know that we did some kind of uh, cyber attack on, I think, on the Internet Research Agency on the day of the midterm election. But what I'm trying to say is, do we have a parallel operations? Do we troll them? Do we what what are our operations against uh, people. Like okay, Russia. so so yeah, so we have an incredibly effective and good um, cyber, if you will, that's for lack of a better word, capability. But we've never quite come to terms of what's the best way to use that weapon. We use our intelligence services for the the great majority, CIA, NSA, sort of to collect intelligence. Our job is to collect intelligence put it through an analytical process to support policymakers. And then there's a smaller part where presidents uh, with congressional oversight can ask for covert action for our intelligence agency to take action, which is what you're suggesting. Hey, can we use the NSA and some of these capabilities to strike back? Um, that's called covert action in our world. The Russians, on the other hand, you know, for historical purposes of how their intelligence services developed, from the days of the Bolshevik revolutions to keep their leadership in power and had a strong internal repression sort of mechanism as well. They do, their, their services developed. So yes, they have an espionage and collection piece too, but the great majority of what they do is this, what we saw in 2016 active measures, which is disinformation, subversion, deception, fake news, assassination, uh, you know, cyber attacks. And so, their intelligence services are more focused on this sowing chaos, creating problems, keeping their enemies off balance, you know, trying to, to manage perceptions overseas, you know, to do these things. And so they, so they do more of that stuff than we do. We definitely have the capability to, but oftentimes we have hesitated to use that weapon for fear of, hey, if we use our NSA and our cyber attacks to sort of shut down Russia, or shut down all the traffic lights or turn off all the computers in Russia, we worry that we're in a glass house. If we start that game, no country is more reliant on computer systems and satellite systems and all these things in the United mm -hmm. States. And so after World War II, with nuclear weapons, we eventually determined what deterrence was. How could we defend ourselves and deter others from, from taking nuclear action against us? We haven't quite figured out what's the best balance between defense, deterrence, and offense in the cyber realm yet. And so, wow. yes, we have incredible capability, but we tend to use it to spy, to collect, not for these other things, because I don't think we've figured out how to use that weapon effectively. I hope at some point we uh, get 
get a little more of a handle on that only because uh, <laughs> maybe at some point. Uh, well, I tend to think we think that others must understand our power and therefore not be willing to push us. Now, the Russians know us well enough that they know, hey, you know, the Americans, we can push them an awful long way before they strike back. Yeah. And now they also know that the president of the United States is going to be the one that's going to really hesitate to strike back. And so they, you know, for, for a much smaller and weaker com- country, they sure take advantage of us and push really far because they know we're not likely to strike back in a way that really hurts them. What do you think the odds are that I just sometimes think about this? Maybe it's just the comedian in me. This whole thing ends with uh, just Trump taking off on a plane from Moscow with a bag of cash. <laughs> <laughs> bag of cash. <laughs> That'd be fine with me. Um, um, yeah, I I wrote an article. You know, it's in a small in just security. You know, is Trump a Russian agent? Mm-hmm. And I looked at it just essentially in the sense of how, as an intelligence officer, we look at that term agent, someone who's you know an asset or an agent. And my view was essentially that he may well be an asset in the sense that the, the Russians are manipulating and using him. You know, through the Cold War, they, they had these things they called useful idiots, people that would do their bidding, maybe wittingly, maybe semi-wittingly, but essentially they would, it would serve their purposes. But they weren't out-and-out out controlled spies that, that you know, met them in a dark alley and exchanged money and did exactly everything the Russians wanted him to do. And so Trump doesn't fit the, um, he doesn't fit the parameters of an agent in, or asset in the sense that we use it. He would be a terrible agent because he would never follow directions. He can't remember anything. Mm. He would just blurt out stuff and get himself in trouble. If I was trying to recruit him as a source, I would, de- I would determine, I'd say no, because he's going to, he's going to screw it up. He's going to get himself caught. You know, what we want with agents is someone who's going to willingly work with us for a bigger picture and keep that relationship secret, that they have something internal to them that makes them realize they're working on a, on a bigger thing on their behalf. Trump can't do that. He's like a man-child baby who mm-hmm. has to brag about things he does, you know, doesn't listen to others. And so in the sense that I think about the CIA running a spy, Trump would be a horrible spy, even if it, even if he's got all the vulnerabilities to take advantage of him, he's uncontrollable. Yeah, but you know, the, Russia, the Russians, that doesn't mean the Russians can't manipulate him. <laughs> doesn't mean the Russians can't use him and put information into his head and sort of, you know, take advantage of him, corrupt him. And, and I think that's more likely what we see here than someone who is like, you know, a Manchurian candidate who's going to run off to Moscow. What, what do you think the mood was election night? I mean, over in, in Putin's palace or wherever I think he lives. They, I think they were shocked. <laughs> I think they were totally, and I think Trump was shocked, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but, for sure. I mean, I, you know, I was shocked. I'm sure you yeah. were shocked. Yeah. Um, I don't think, I think in their world, um, causing chaos, causing ha- havoc, supporting Trump was still beneficial to them if Hillary Clinton won, because then they could still push this system in the system. Trump would still be a free agent out there saying all kinds of crazy stuff and pushing for Hillary Clinton's um, impeachment and the Russians could f- push talking points through him and all these other kind of things. I don't think they thought he was going to win. Yeah, it, that must have been. I Maybe I, I what you think like 100 years from now that we'll get the files from Russia <laughs> yeah. and we'll find out. You know. I hope so. What I know how hard it is to get those files. You know, trying to get an agent in the right place who can get this kind of stuff, it does happen, but it isn't isn't just because we because we want it badly, we're going to have success. It's a it's a, it's getting lucky breaks and the right people in the right place. Um, and I'm sure the U.S. government knows more than we certainly in the public know about what the Russians are up to and what they know and what they thought and those type of things. Um, but I certainly hope that there is some sort of break. So that we understand, you know, what sources the Russians spies, the Russians were using inside the, the system. Because we saw a lot in 2016. We saw cyber attacks. We saw these troll factories. We saw assassinations in Britain. We saw the GRU try to do cyber hacks and all this kind of stuff. The one thing we haven't seen at all is the SVR. That's their intelligence service. Mm. They as part of their doctrine and as part of what they say throughout history underpins all of these actions we've talked about, this deception, disinformation, subversion, are human spies run by 
their espionage service, the SVR. We've seen nothing about that. Hmm. So I guarantee the Russians have spies and they're running spies that have helped them aim, helped them understand where to put money, where to put resources, where to put how to information. And we don't have any of that yet. And I'm confident at some point pieces of that will come out and, and we'll have a much better sense of what happened. Trump, uh, I just have like two more questions. I, I just thought of this now. Trump, uh, from their news reports, talks on an unsecured cell phone. Um, <laughs> how many, hypothetically, how many intelligence agencies might be listening? Uh, uh, it's, it's incredibly easy to. And so essentially everybody that can, like the one thing we have to remember is we're the number one target in the world. We're the biggest, most powerful country in the world. And everything we do impacts policy everywhere else, but commercially, certainly economically, foreign policy wise, military wise. And so um, the ability to break into cell networks and, and, and that type of stuff is not tremendously hard. And I'm so I'm sure that at least the major powers are listening to that and maybe plenty of others too. Um, you know, the one thing though is, okay, whether he's speaking about specifically sensitive stuff, he probably is, but if they're using him to understand him and get a bead on what makes Trump tick and how they can manipulate him, they, at this point, you hardly need more of a cell phone because we see it every day. We see it in his tweets. We see it in his crazy behavior. He is not hard to figure out. Yeah. You know, you look at what he's did with Iran, with North Korea. What you need to do is, you know, take his threats, realize he doesn't mean them, realize he has no way out. And then he's going to try to do a deal and try to, like, <laughs> soften you up and act like, you know. And then and so manipulating him and playing him is, is kind of easy. Yeah. The dealmaker thing is funny because really, from my knowledge of of what you did at the CIA, I mean, just in general, that's really a sort of a form of deal making. How getting someone to put their own life at risk just to to help the United States, that's deal making. And when I do interviewing people, that's also a form of deal making in a way. Uh I don't know what he does, but being born into money, that's not <laughs> I, I feel like you as a 30 year veteran in the CIA, you know way more about deal making than than he would. Well, I don't uh, think he's made any effective deals. I mean, yeah. like, you know, he's he believes that if you if you threaten people and then be nice to them, you're going to somehow get something. But we we're no better off with North Korea, really, than we were. We're worse off with Iran than we yeah. were. You know, worse off with with uh, Russia, you know, trying to push China on economic and trade things might have been, a, you know, in fact, I would argue it's probably probably was long overdue and we needed to do something. But the way he's doing it, um, you just don't trust that he's going to give in at the right time or he's going to you know, do the right thing. He, uh, he's not using the resources at his control in the U.S. government and the U.S. You know, private sector t to the extent that he he's all basing on his own personality and thinking that somehow he's this stable genius that's going to be able to pull, pull, pull these things off. And there's no evidence that that's ever worked in his entire life. What do our allies do? We already know the case where he gave away uh, what I read was called code word intelligence, uh, where that probably got somebody killed to the Russians. What, what do they do now if they need to tell us something? What would you do? I mean, well, you mean like if, if uh, our allies or something? Need to yeah, they have a piece of, but they know that yeah. it might get somewhere else. It's an excellent question, and it's a serious question. If you're the British services or you're the Germans or Japanese or something, you know, day in and day out, and let me put it this way. In CIA, the majority of our intelligence came from other security services, from our allies, giving us the secrets that they have because they trusted us to keep them secret and to use that information to support policymakers and presidents. If they think... The, the vulnerability is the president of the United States bl blurting out that information, giving it away, or even attacking those allies, they're going to stop giving it. And so mm -hmm. I guarantee that there's meetings now at the top of the British security services and national security where they are saying, OK, we have we got this lucky break. We got a guy in the, you know, the top of the Iranian government who's giving us this information. Do we give it to the Americans? Uh, maybe what we do is we take a little bit of this information and try to work with certain people we know in CIA and the State Department so they sort of understand them. But but they're going to be giving us less because they worry about that we can't be trusted anymore. 
And, and that's a big deal. Yeah, my last question is, uh, might be considered classified, I don't know, but <laughs> did your last right. name, <laughs> uh, I always like setting up my own uh, punchline. Yeah. Did your last name give you an edge in the CIA hiring process? <laughs> yeah, I don't like my last name that much. It's funny, you know. Um, no, because essentially then, but once you're in the CIA, they give you a alias. If they, well, you have aliases okay. and you have pseudonyms. So they give you a pseudonym. So everybody who knows you in CIA, every time I write a cable, I write an email, it uses my pseudo, my fake name. Huh. And so probably more people know me by that name than knew really? by my real name. Anyway, yeah. So they don't... I, so if you if you were to get, you know, say Attorney General Barr says, I want to, you know, this secret, declassify your, you know, intelligence reports and cable reports to see what was happening. He's not going to be able to understand them or read them anyway. And the names in those things are fake names or pseudonyms. So, you know, if they're going to go try to attack the next Peter Strzok, they're going to be find themselves attacking a fake name because <laughs> they won't understand where it comes from. Yeah. So the name was only known by your, uh, I guess, your boss or that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, inside we knew each other's names. Right. I mean, we were, it was fine. But but essentially, in all correspondence and traffic. So if I'm living, I'm living in Russia and I'm writing back to the people on all these different things on different that don't know me personally. They don't know my real name. They know my pseudo. Did you ever use the name John Barron? No, <laughs> John, you know, I you've wonder been a, if anybody did use that for alias. Not that yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a whole, yeah, yeah. The, I guess okay. the one thing that he and you have in common. Uh, you know, you've been incredibly generous. Um, uh, how do people, I know I know you, you've you got the Cypher Brief, and how do people reach you for speaking? Well, the or, Cypher Brief isn't mine. It's funny, a lot of people, even inside, oh. think, oh, the Cypher Brief, they, you, that's really cool what you've done. Um, no, it's this um, woman, Kelly, who used to work at CNN, who sort of created that and built a really impressive network of people. Oh. When I came out of CIA, I met her and I started writing some for them. I haven't much of late. I've sort of moved on. I write for I write a little bit of The Atlantic and just security some and, and political and New York Times a little bit and stuff. Um, but no, it's not, you know, it's not me. Wow. <laughs> I, I, I work with them and I go to their events and things. But Well, I just want to thank you again uh, for, you know, bringing your very unique life experience and perspective and, uh, you know, I'd love to have you back on sometime and, you know, if you ever want to talk. I appreciate it. All right. Hopefully next. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, you, you take care. I, okay. I, I'm afraid there are going to be lots of more stuff to talk about. So I don't think, I don't think we're out of our national nightmare quite yet. You it's, it's, it's great for what I do and it's probably in some ways <laughs> good for what you do, but uh, yeah, you and I are going to have a lot to talk about. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much. Have a great day. Uh, Memorial Day. Yeah, you, you, you too, sir. And uh, yeah, right. have a great Memorial Day. All right. Thanks a lot. Take care.